So my name is Judy Billing. I'm the technical research manager at Organic Monitor in the UK. I'm going to give you um, a quick overview of what natural org and organic ingredients in cosmetics are all about. We've kind of, it's a little joke, a dummies guide. We're not saying you're dummies, but this is kind of like a, almost a sort of beginner's guide. So first of all, um, for those of you who don't know us, who, who are we? Um, well, we're a company that provides business services. Um, some people think because it's called Organic Monitor, we go around and we tell you you're not organic enough. But no, that's not us. We don't do certification. We don't, uh, we don't check people. We actually do research publications, research and consulting, both in the business area and technical, which is my side of things. We do lots of seminars like this. We do workshops, um, in-house training, whatever you need. And we also have an event um, called the Sustainable Cosmetic Summit, which we run in different parts of the world um, every year, yeah, in Europe, normally in Paris, in uh, New York, um, and also in Latin America. And next year, we will be doing um, Hong Kong again. So I'll give you our stand number at the end if you want to, to come and get more information. So a bit of background. So basically the major issue here is how do we define what a natural cosmetic is? There are no formal definitions. Um, so you can kind of feel free to make up your own one if you want to. There's no legal protection of the term natural and organic. Um, cosmetic ingredients, as we know, normally need some kind of chemical modification for them to really perform the function we want. And there are virtually no regulations globally. The exception there is there is an organic regulation in California. But in most of the rest of the world, often foods are regulated, but not cosmetics. So if you're a retailer or a consumer, how do you actually know those products you're being offered? Are they genuinely natural or even organic? Or are they just a product that's been greenwashed? So what is natural? How do we define a natural ingredient? Well, a lot of people talk about things that are physically processed ingredients that have come from plants. Or it could be animals or a mineral source. Um, that tends to be what people think of as natural ingredients. But what about if you have to extract those with a petrochemical solvent? Is that still natural? Um, biotechnology, I mean, it's a big growing area in cosmetics. Fermentation, we've been using uh, fermented products, wine, etc., cetera, for, for years. And actually, normally, we consider fermentation is fine. Uh, we can use microalgae as little mini chemical factories. And we tend to consider, consider these as natural processes. But if you start to genetically modify the organism, is that still natural? I think in a lot of cases, uh, people would say no. In Europe, we have something called REACH. So it's um, a chemicals regulation, but they have a definition of a natural substance. Um, it's quite a strange one, and I'll read it out. It says, substances which occur in nature means a naturally occurring substance as such, unprocessed or processed only by manual, mechanical or gravitational means, by dissolution in water, by flotation, by extraction with water, by steam distillation, or by heating solely to remove water. And then the one that really gets me, they say at the end, or was, which is extracted from air by any means. Do we use those in, ingredients from air? I can't think of any, but uh, that is their definition of a natural substance. So again, if you start using any kind of solvents, even glycerin, it, to them it's not a natural material. And if you compare that to what we would maybe conventionally think of as a natural material, there are things like decolorization, fractionation, and even the, the biotech processes. 
REACH wouldn't consider those as natural. So it's all down to our interpretation. OK, so we've got things that we're extracting from plants. Um, OK, we, we probably know what we're talking about. Oils, essential oils, etc. But what about if we start doing some chemistry and we start talking about naturally derived? Um, uh, our friends at Natru, who are one of the standards organizations, they actually call them derived natural. You might call them chemically modified. Lots of different names. I tend to prefer naturally derived. But this could be where the materials, where the majority of the molecule, at least 50%, probably more, is derived from natural materials. But what should compose the other 50%? That's where we start to get into uh, to more issues. What chemistry is acceptable? Um, and let's face it, sustainability is by far the bigger picture these days. Where does that fit with this type of chemistry? You know, we're also considering the environment um, and uh, many other um, aspects of sustainability. I've also started to hear people, particularly in the US, talking about products that are chemically clean. What does that mean? Well, when we think about it, everything, these flowers are obvious, but this table, everything is made of chemicals. We're all a bunch of chemicals. If they come from plants, we tend to call them phytochemicals. But basically, chemically clean really doesn't exist. Everything is a chemical. And we also have to remember that natural doesn't always equal safe. Um, there are many great poisons in nature, as we know. Uh, in fact, the worst poisons come from nature. Um, we also have to remember these days with social media, the internet, customers um, and consumers have so much information and they're able to question every single ingredient. Um, clients that I work with, I see emails come in and they ask such detail. What is this ingredient? Why has it got this funny name? What does it do? So we have to remember that we are open to scrutiny. And it's not always easy to differentiate something that's naturally derived versus something that's petrochemically derived, so a synthetic. Um, in, in that case, you, the ingredient name on the, the label may be the same, but we don't know what, uh, where it's coming from. I've also f found this trend of some um, companies, when they're formulating, they're starting to, to worry about what the inky name looks like on the label. I don't want anything that sounds scary or chemical. So they might actually be cutting out ingredients that actually work really well. Um, they may be highly sustainable, but the name doesn't sound good. And unfortunately, I'm sure some of you are possibly raw material suppliers. You know, you can't choose your inky name. You get given it, you're told this is it. Um, we also have had um, a number of issues, and this is a, an example from the UK, around advertising. So um, this TV ad was actually banned uh, because it was suggested it contained no man-made chemical ingredients. Um, this is a, a brand that was um, acquired by Colgate Palmolive called Zero Percent. So I guess you'd think from the name it ought to be zero percent of uh, man-made chemicals, but that is not the case. Um, they talk about it containing between 9 and 11 ingredients compared to the market average of 23 ingredients. So their whole philosophy is around no parabens, no phenoxyethanol, no colorants, um, and the last one, uh, no phthalates. But it doesn't actually tell you the true story of what's actually in there. Now, they do meet the um, eco label, the EU eco label. It does have fewer chemical ingredients and it's uh, a mild biodegradable formulation. And they talk about the moisturizers being of 100% natural origin. 
again, claiming the, the things that people don't like. But actually, when you look at the ingredient list, the second ingredient is sodium laureth sulfate. I'm not saying there's necessarily anything wrong with that, but it is ethoxylated. It's something you wouldn't normally use in a natural cosmetic. It's also got parfum, fragrance, which I suspect is not a natural fragrance. Um, Cocomido propyl betaine I've also put in a slightly different color because some standards will allow you to use that, others won't. So there's some naturally derived stuff, but also some things in there that maybe I wouldn't want to see. When you actually look at their role on deodorant, um, it gets a little worse. So it talks about sensitive skin, um, contains the natural mil mineral alum, which protects against body odor in a more natural way. Actually, look at the ingredient list. Sorry, the red pen has come out quite a lot here. Ethoxylated, propoxylated, volatile silicones, um, silicones with phenoxyethanol, BHT. This is certainly not a natural formulation. Um, and as I say, the um, Advertising Standards Authority in the UK um, didn't like the, the advert that they had with the lady with the colored, or several ladies with colored paint running down their body. Um, and the implication to the consumer was it didn't have man-made chemicals, but in fact it does. So how natural are products? Um, well, you can get lots of products out there on the market which are said to be natural or organic, but not all of them will achieve the stricter definitions. And we have our own definition of an authentic natural product. Uh, many of the products out there that might say they're natural or even organic may contain significant amounts of synthetic, synthetic chemicals. But of course, when you look at the ingredient list on the back, that tells you the real story. And, you know, as I said before, consumers have access to that information as well. And they're questioning whether this product really is green and what the marketing claims really um, are telling them. So a couple of years ago, we looked at a lot of brands around the world and did a, a brand assessment for their naturalness was kind of the, uh, the term we made up. And the aim of the study was to it, uh, assess the extent of the greenwashing that's going on in the natural and organic I industry, um, to kind of track the evolution of product formulations um, and whether standards are being adopted over time. And it also helps when I work with clients to help them position their products in the market, because it is a very competitive marketplace. And I'll tell you a little bit more about the study later on. There are a number of controversial materials, um, by which I mean things that the, the various standards bodies around the world disagree about. There are a list of so-called nature identical preservatives. Um, some people would say, well, there's no such thing as nature identical, they're just synthetic. Other people will say, well, they do occur in nature, but we just can't extract them, therefore we have to use some of these things. So things like sodium benzoate, potassium sorbate, etc., which are used in the food industry. Sorry, my mouse is sticking here. Come on, that's it. Um, so surfactants, um, particularly the amphoteric mild surfactants, tend to be something like the cocomido propyl betaine. Some people say, well, we have to accept it, although it's not that natural. Other people say, no, it's, it's too chemical, we don't want to allow it. Hair conditioning ingredients, the so-called quats, that's another one that are quite controversial. Even certain vitamins and actives, if they're not from a natural source, even though they might be something that we, uh, we have in our bodies, people will say, no, they're not natural enough. And the, the nano, nanoparticle sunscreen um, ingredients are something that also have been a, a source of a lot of uh, debate within the um, natural and organic industry. 
So what exactly am I talking about? There's quite a long list of these things. Everything from Alantuin, which does occur in comfrey root. I'm not actually sure you can buy a natural Alantuin. I think virtually 100% of what's available out there is um, synthetic. But a lot of people think that it is a natural ingredient and some standards do allow it. Things like the amphoacetates, some standards allow caprylarglycine, for example, which isn't particularly natural. There is some debate around the carboxymethylcellulose ingredients, um, so say some of the quats and other amphoteric materials, other surfactants, and the list goes on. Even isopropyl myristate, which um, at the moment is accepted under the ECOCERT standard, is going to disappear under the harmonized COSMOS standard because the isopropyl part of the molecule doesn't occur in nature, it's petrochemical. Panthenol, one of these pro-vitamin materials, but it's synthetic, and so on. But also, um, standards also don't want you to use certain processes for your ingredients. So you're not allowed to use things like gamma irradiation, which is very useful for getting bugs, particularly in things like clays for face masks. Obviously, they don't want you to use chlorine bleaching. Genetic modification is another um, big hot topic at the moment, because um, particularly with things like your, your biotech industry, they can do so much more if they can genetically modify the organism but certainly the organic um, organizations really are very anti-genetic modification. Even certain reaction catalysts aren't liked. And certainly you can't use harsh chemical processing. So, going back to, uh, to this naturalness um, rating that we did, we looked on a 10-point scale at um, a whole host of um, products, as I say. I'll just wait a second. So, we starting at one, so this is really um, something that is almost totally synthetic. It doesn't make any pretensions to be natural. Then at two, you've got naturally inspired. So these are kind of the products where, you know, we've dripped in a little bit of natural extract. We've got some pretty flowers or leaves on the packaging. But really, when you look at the formulation, it's not particularly natural. Then you kind of got the, the semi-natural, so the kind of, you know, along the road towards natural, but still are quite a lot of syn synthetics. Then the interesting part was in the middle, the four to six category, where I, I kind of gave a range for things that uh, are natural. So if um, six was kind of really highly natural, four was obviously not quite as natural. Um, many brands in that space in the middle. Of course, if you're actually certified by one of the bodies as natural, then somebody else has done that checking, so that I gave that a rating of seven. Um, and then eight to ten was the, were the organic products. So eight was an organic cosmetic, but it's not certified. And then nine and ten were really um, reserved for things that were very high in organic content with 10 being something that was 100% organic, which is quite difficult to do. So let's have a look at a, um, a naturals range. Um, this is the, the hairstyling polish that I've picked out. This is actually an Australian product. Um, you can see I've been busy with my red pen again. Uh, we've got PVPVA copolymer. Well, that's pretty much a standard hair, uh, hair styling um, ingredient. We've got polysorbate 20, which maybe sounds more natural, but is actually ethoxylated. We've got some other polymers, phenoxyethanol, some preservatives that, uh, that I wouldn't want to see in a natural product, even EDTA. So we have got a few little natural bits in there. 
So actually, I was feeling mean that day, and I gave it a score of one, because really, there's nothing different between that and a conventional hairstyling product. This one um, is an uncertified product from Asia, um, a natural face wash. I put natural in inverted commas. Again, you can see quite a lot of things in red. So the, uh, the Loramide DEA, um, the CTRF20, the PEG40 stearate, and so on. These are all ingredients that really I don't think should have a place in a natural product. The butylene glycol I've put in purple because if this is one of these ingredients that can be either synthetically produced or it can be produced by fermentation. And unfortunately, the name is exactly the same, so you don't know which it is. But we've even got some synthetic colors. We've got parabens in there. So um, although it's got the term natural associated with it, it really isn't a natural product. I called this, I gave this one a score of two. Now this one scored much higher. It got an eight. So this is a, uh, a product from the US. Um, it's in the contains organic category, so it's not fully organic, but it has some organic. But it's not actually got, uh, got any formal certification. But as you can see, I didn't actually get uh, to put my red pen around anything here. So it's got um, some obviously things like aloe vera juice, but it's got surfactants that um, are quite mild. Um, actually not that many ingredients and fragranced with essential oils. And in fact, a lot of the ingredients are organically derived. So uh, that one, I guess, if it had been certified, would have got a higher rating. Um, and this one is a certified organic baby cream from Malaysia. Um, this one did score, it couldn't quite score uh, um, 10 because it, uh, it does, uh, it's not completely organic, but as you can see, again, lots of organic ingredients. The emulsifiers are uh, based on olive oil. They're the materials that are used quite frequently in natural formulations. So I thought this one was a, a pretty good product. You can see they, they talk about 100% um, of the total ingredients from natural origin um, and 92.2% of the total ingredients from organic farming. 99.9% of the plant ingredients are from organic farming. So they've really tried their hardest to get as organic as possible in this particular um, case. And I guess baby products are something that um, people are very concerned about. Um, and I guess it's an area that, um, where we'll see more activity in the future. This product is um, certified by EcoCert. So um, I'm actually a formulator myself. I've been formulating, I'm not going to tell you how many years because then you'll think I'm ancient, but a long, long, long time. And you can imagine I've seen a lot of changes over the years. But maybe it's, it's probably about the last 10 years when I've really been concentrating on natural and organic formulation. And it's certainly become a lot easier over that time. So my question was, is it getting easier? Yes, definitely, um, as more and more ingredients become available. But there are still challenges. It does depend if you're going to go for a standard and work to that particular standard. Um, and also what type of product you're trying to formulate. Some are much easier than others. So you, um, I actually think selecting your active ingredients in your plants is actually the easy bit because there's lots of those available. Getting your functional ingredients right is very critical. Um, A, to make sure you meet the green definitions you're trying to achieve, but also so that the sensory properties are right. Because as people, we, we like things that feel nice and look good. Um, and you might be able to sell a product to somebody once, but you want them to come back and really fall in love with your product and love the way it works. So the range of options is certainly growing. 
Um, but organic ingredient availability is still limited in, in uh, a number of areas. So you have to watch, if you're going to go organic, that you can actually um, make sure you have enough raw material that... Uh, We've seen things like argan oil, for example, where um, you know when big companies move in and start buying up the stocks of argan oil, maybe there isn't enough left for some of the smaller companies. Jojoba oil was another example where there were harvest problems, both in Israel and in South America. Suddenly, you couldn't get hold of jojoba oil for love or money. So you have to make sure that uh, certainly if you're going down the organic route that your the availability of your products is there going forward you have to remember that you're making a, co a cosmetic product the same as any other so you've got to uh, do all of the normal testing the product stability look at the color the odor and also what the cost implications are you know cost is uh, for, for very prestige products might not be a problem, but for products you maybe want to sell at a more affordable price, obviously your natural ingredients are going to be a little more expensive. It, but it's not all about what your ingredients are. You may also want to think about your whole sustainability profile. What's the energy usage in your production? Can you do a cold mix, for example? What's your packaging like? What's your CO2 footprint, your water footprint? As we know, in certain parts of the world, water is becoming a very scarce resource. So these things are equally as important. So if we're formulating to meet standards, what do we need to do? Well, I have to say, I usually start with a spreadsheet in front of me. It is a numbers game. You've got to meet the numbers. You've got to know what you're doing, obviously what ingredients you could use, but then you've got to meet the criteria. Um, and as I say, a good spreadsheet often helps. You also need to make sure you check the whole manufacturing process of an ingredient. So uh, I mentioned earlier on that no irradiation, no genetic modification. I've known companies go right the way down the line, getting ready to launch their product. They've gone for certification and discovered that the clay they're going to use in their face mask has been irradiated. So then they've got to start again with formulation. So just check that uh, you know, your raw material supplier can give you the right information. You must. Uh, the suppliers must prove the absence of um, genetically modified organisms, so they will have to produce a certificate. Um, and also, there's no, none of the ionizing radiation. So maybe it's easier to start with ingredients that are already on one of the certification lists. EcoCert Green Life certainly is still the major standard that raw material suppliers tend to get their ingredients approved by and you will find there's a database of those ingredients. It's something like nearly 3,700 ingredients now that are certified by EcoCert and something like 1,600 now to Cosmos, which is what we're migrating to in 2017. So yes, as we approach that deadline, um, Cosmos may be the better way to go. Um, actually start now. Um, and make sure that your ingredients are Cosmos approved, if that's what you want to do. However, if you're looking at your, uh, having uh, your products on sale in the US, you might be more interested in Natural Products Association. Uh, you may prefer than a true standard for Europe and certain other parts of the world. They do offer an alternative certification route. And these are all things to consider. But my plea would be, decide what you're doing at the beginning, not halfway through. I have had clients who've said, oh yeah, I want to do this. I'm not going to certify my products. Then you'll almost finish the formulation and they go, oh, do you think we could get Cosmos certification for this? Start with that idea in your head at the beginning. It's much easier. What's still difficult to do? Shampoos and rinse-off products are certainly more of a headache than skincare. 
you want them to perform as well as conventional products, but at an economic cost. Maybe consumers are not going to pay such high prices for something that you know just they wash their hair with. So uh, think about whether you can achieve that um, with surfactants that you can uh, achieve. Hair conditioners are tricky. Um, I've said making a hair conditioner that performs at all is quite, uh, quite difficult. Hair styling, as we saw that Australian product, is quite, quite limited in terms of the amount of hair styling polymers out there. Most of them are petrochemically derived. Even getting a clear alcohol gel, for example, for a hand sanitizer isn't that easy. Um, Water-based gels um, that have nice sensory properties also a little tricky. Um, I'm not sure we'll ever, well, I won't say ever, but for a long time, I don't think we'll see natural antiperspirants. They just, it just doesn't seem to be possible to find an antiperspirant chemical that, uh, that comes from nature. Deodorants, we do have a few options. And color cosmetics. I mean, a lot of people talk about mineral makeup. Is that really any more natural? A lot of those, uh, those colors still have to be processed, and actually they, they are, in a way, quite uh, chemical by the end of it. So, uh, and I'm, I believe I'm not a color cosmetic person myself, but I believe it is quite difficult to get bright colors using just the, uh, the approved natural pigment. So just a couple of words on hair conditioners. Um, because it's one of the ones I picked out as being a bit tricky. You do need to deposit hair conditioning agents onto the hair to facilitate the wet and dry combing. You can't use silicones because, uh, you know, they really are not um, an option for a natural cosmetics. But silicone alternatives do exist and companies do offer things that work in a similar way. Traditionally, you've used quaternary polymers for example, polyquaternium 10 or polyquaternium 7 in, uh, in a shampoo, but unfortunately the standards don't allow those. So you could use proteins and amino acids, for example, to repair the hair. But in fact, the COSMOS standard, um, in, which is the, the, the new, uh, more harmonized standard that's coming in, they actually do now allow you to use a biodegradable quaternary um, and guar hydroxypropyl trimonium chloride. These are both exceptions because they realize that there is a, is a problem with, uh, with getting a really good green hair conditioner. Previously, what people sold were basically just emulsions and it was the oil that was uh, being deposited on the hair. So what's the future? Well, I think slowly but surely we're getting closer to a unified definition of what natural is and also uh, naturally derived. We, we're coming closer in terms of our definitions. My, my question is, do we re need to reconsider the whole area of um, genetically modified organisms for natural cosmetics? I, I definitely for organic cosmetics, that's something that they're really against. But are we going to actually inhibit the, um, the, the, the way technology is moving if we say there can be no use of genetic modification of the organisms? If companies can prove it never gets out of the bioreactor, is that really a problem? That's something that is, I think, going to be a big debate in the future. Should we maybe allow some irradiation of sensitive cosmetic ingredients? It's a question. Maybe it's preferable to having product spoilage um, and consumer harm. Um, it definitely is not good to have products recalled from the market because uh, they're, uh, they're growing bugs. So again, um, I'm, I guess the organic guys will never allow irradiation, but maybe, uh, maybe in natural cosmetics, we could. And I, my big thing, I guess, for many years has been, can we actually help the average consumer, not the, not the person who goes out to department stores and buys really, really expensive products, 
we can cater for them. Can we, can we make natural cosmetics affordable for all consumers? I'd like to walk into a supermarket and see shelves and shelves of natural, really natural products, not the ones with just the little drip of um, natural ingredient. That would be great. Um, and also, let's don't forget, we need to think about building in sustainability as well. It's not all about where it comes from, but it's also how we actually produce it and our company um, ethics um, and really about the wider issues. So in conclusion, I think there's still a long way to go for products to, to have, for there to be a universal definition of natural or even organic. But as I say, I think we're, we're getting there. The lack of regulation around the world makes it unlikely we'll, we'll have that in the near future. However, now in the industry, I think we're all starting to talk the same language and some norms are developing. There is an ISO standard that um, is in process that may help to level the playing field. That's, uh, that's something we'll have to see. But private standards, so all of those logos you see, um, one thing about them, they may have different ideas, but they do give confidence to the consumer that somebody has checked your product and that really is truly um, a natural or organic product. Um, and there are many new green and sustainable ingredients now out there, and uh, you'll see many of those on the floor of the show. So if you want to know more, we're on stand M17. I'll go back there for the next hour or so, um, come and chat. Um, I think we have a bit of time for uh, questions anyway. Um, we've got various technical insights reports if you want to look at any more detail on some of the, the areas I've been talking about. If not, we've got a free newsletter, so do sign up to that. It's on our website. Um, and it's, it's only once a month, so you won't get bombarded with too much stuff. But it tells you what's hot and happening in the, uh, the natural and organic um, industry. So thank you very much for your attention.